So today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different on the episode. I'm going to be talking about something that I'm working on and using it, hopefully, to help you understand not only the fiction that I'm doing, but how you might be able to adapt ideas into a world that you want to create yourself. So if you're just a reader of mine and curious, this should hopefully give you some things to think about. And if you're a creative looking for inspiration on how you can better adapt the genres that you want into your fiction, hopefully that will help you too. So today we're going to be talking about the Galactic Underworld on today's Project Shadow. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name's Charlie. You might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer C.E. Dorset, especially if you're reading my new book, Crucify My Love, or you're reading any of the stuff that I'm putting up over at World Anvil, because yeah, I'm putting a lot of stuff over on World Anvil, and they're not a sponsor, though I wouldn't say no to a sponsorship from them. Hint, hint. Well, we have already covered what we're going to be talking about in today's show, so before we get into all that, if you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. It tells the algorithms to share the podcast with more people. The more people that listen, the bigger the community. The bigger the community, the better the chance we have of actually, you know, communicating with each other in real life. And after all, that's why I do this in the first place. All right, so... Uh, our Solemn Hour. This is a story that has been rooting around in the back of my brain for a very long time, and it never quite worked. And I realized one of the main reasons it didn't work is I had conceived of it as several separate books that it was different stories with different characters in different settings. And that's not actually what it is or what it wants to be. When I started playing around with the idea that these stories actually occur concurrently and are all building towards something, that's when magic happened. The universe kind of opened up to me and I realized exactly how I could tell the story and... I am very excited, and it's probably, maybe, looks like, the project I'm going to be working on during NaNoWriMo. Even though it's going to be longer than 50,000 words, my goal is to get 50,000 words written in it during that month. And that's not going to count the world building and stuff that I'm doing now that's going up on World Anvil. Now, this setting is, in a lot of ways, a reboot of the setting that my previous books, the four in the Liquid Sky series, and, um, well, actually, yeah, Fate's Harrow, and um, Shine Like Thunder, all take place in. And when I say it's a reboot, it's kind of a soft reboot, in that there were some things that I really loved about those worlds, and those books, and there were some things that I didn't that I th thought could have been done a little bit better or differently, and it's one of the reasons why I haven't revisited them in such a long time. And I'm actually doing that now. I'm One of the projects that I have is actually going through and doing a new edition of those books to bring them in line with the current state of the world building, and that's something that you can look forward to next year. So, yay. <laughs> one of the things that always made this sci-fi setting unique to me, and one of the things that I always loved about it, was that I... Okay, where to start? I am obsessed with wuxia. Wuxia is a style of fiction, a genre of fiction, very popular in China. And you can find it in books, you can find it in comics, you can find it in movies, video games, what have you. 
When I'm talking to a Western audience, generally the easiest way to get them to understand what I'm talking about is to talk about Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is based on the third book in Wang Delu's um, Iron Crane Pentology. And it, it's one of those fascinating books within Wuxia. I'm actually currently reading uh, Jin Young's A Hero Born, which is the first book in the Condor Heroes series of 12 novels. And Macmillan just recently did a new translation of it. And I'm so excited. And I've mentioned it on the podcast before because when I'm done reading it, I'm definitely going to be talking about it more on the show. So if you want to be up for that, you may want to get started because we're almost done. It's a big book. A lot of stuff happening in it. It's not really a big book as far as word count, but it's a big book as far as keeping track of the characters, the ideas, and everything that's going on in it. It's, it's fascinating. Anywho, I loved the idea of doing Space Wuxia, and I started developing this notion of a Space Wuxia in about 2000, 2001, somewhere around there. And the first iteration that you see of that is in um, the Four Liquid Sky books, and you see this idea get developed further in uh, Fate's Horo, and then in Shine Like Thunder. I really wanted to go back to this because I think there's just something fascinating about it. So Wuxia, if you're not fami familiar with it and its associated ideas, is basically a story about martial artists who are like superhero martial artists. They practice numerous arts such as Qinggong or light body technique, which gives them the ability to basically make their body lighter so that they can kind of run through the air. They can kind of, you know, if you saw Crouching Tiger or um, Hero or um, House of Flying Daggers or The Duel or, man, I could be here listening forever, any of the Zoo Warriors, which is technically a uh, Zhensha, but it's a related genre, the Condor Hero movies, Once Upon a Time in China... <laughs> There's a lot. I could really just spend way too much time listening. But in addition to light body and some of the other techniques, such as ne, ne gong, which allows them to harden their body, either for making their punches more powerful, or in the case of some characters being almost impervious to strikes, all of it takes place within something called the Jiang Hu, which literally translates to the river lake. And this is the world of cultivation. This is the world where martial artists are training themselves to be ever better. And there are quite a few kind of, I'm just going to call them tropes that have developed around the Jung Hu over the years, such as the code of the Xia, the uh, martial hero that takes part in these stories. There's the idea of the various sects, bands, schools, clans, what have you. And it's something that I really thought when I started putting all this together all those years ago, made for a very interesting world that wasn't a carbon copy of Star Wars. Star Wars was inspired by the Jedi Gekai, I'm sorry, Jedi Geki films of Japan, and thus has a much more samurai-like Jedi that is, of course, part of the governmental structure, because the samurai were a part of Imperial Japan. Wuxia, on the other hand, the heroes who live in the Jianghu shun the government for most for the most part. They do not participate in the power structures that are because they have their own agendas, be it for personal gain, personal glory, or just to improve themselves and show that they are the best fighters out there. And this one tweak 
to the universe, this one tweak to the galaxy, I felt initially was a great way to prevent me from just recreating something that I already love, and that's Star Wars. Because Star Wars has kind of become renowned for just having the Jedi and the Sith, and that duality really fuels everything that makes Star Wars what it is. Once you start incorporating this concept of the Jung Hu into a setting, and you have numerous groups, bands, and what have you, then the sheer diversity of organizations that are operating at this level and who are able to cultivate these powers that do not necessarily arise from an all pervasive force, but are generally seen as cultivating one's own internal power, one, one's own energy, one's own chi to make it strong enough to achieve these miraculous effects. It does provide a difference from Star Wars, though that's not the only reason why I wanted to do it. So the new world that we're encountering in my setting is going to be referred to as the, either the Urgal, the Ganshar, the Gutir, and these are all words from a conlang that I'm working on. I'm actually currently in the midst of developing about six different conlangs for this setting. I don't know how many of them will have full vocabularies and grammars and be able to be spoken, because I am developing them as part of the world building and thus allowing myself not to get distracted down the rabbit hole that is constructing languages. But the Ganshar is the martial forest. It is the place where the cultivators go. It is where they develop their powers. I'm sorry, the Gutier is technically the martial forest. The Ganshar is the world of cultivation. And when I started writing up everything that we have here, I wanted to have an excuse or an explanation as to why it was so pervasive. Because when you're looking back at the actual wuxia fiction, it makes sense because the stories for the most part take place in China, and thus there already is an overarching culture that pervades the stories. If I'm going to be dealing with different worlds, with different histories and different cultures, I needed to find a way to explain how this unified idea of the Ganshar came about. How, why do people from various worlds and planets all hold the similar idea of a galactic underworld that kind of governs itself and is focused on cultivating this internal power. And that's where the idea for the Ansara and the Anki came from. Now, the Ansara are going to be a very important group in the setting. And I'll actually be talking about them more later. I'm currently doing the write-up on them right now. I've been working on it probably the longest because it has a lot of moving parts. The Ansara rose to power about 2,000 years prior to our story start. And for about 1,000 years, they controlled a large portion of the galaxy until a terrible tragedy befell them and the galaxy itself fell into a dark age as a result. But the cultural impact of the Ansara lingers, it lasts, and nowhere is that seen, well, it's probably seen most relevant in the three peoples that emerged from the destroyed empire, and that being the Mulin, the Sen, and the Shinari. But beyond them, it can be most seen in the legacy that they left behind with the Gun Gunshar, with the Urugal, this galactic underworld that originally developed on their homeworld 
and then spread throughout the galaxy and became a place where people could test themselves and live outside the general roles of power that exist in the galactic setting. So here we will find criminal syndicates, we will find um, religious groups that are solely about understanding the universe and maximizing their own internal cultivation. We will find bounty hunters, we will find all manner of people roving around and seeking to find a place in this profound counterculture that pervades everything. And it was tricky not to just try to convert it into saying it's the Jung Hu, but in sci-fi. And I know that from experience because when I wrote Liquid Sky, pretty much it was the Jung Hu, but in sci-fi. And I think that that lessened some of the impact of that story, which is one of the reasons why it's on my list for a new edition, for a new revision, once I get the world building reset finished. You see, it's one of those things when you're trying to take a genre and fuse it into another genre. If you remember, we talked about this before, where you have to pick your priorities. You have to decide what's important and find your focus. Each one becomes a limiter on the other. Just adding wuxia into space opera, which is the two primary genres that are being mashed up into this new setting, as well as some concepts from Magipunk, it cha necessarily changes how the world is conceived and how the world operates. And so I have to take some of that into effect. This idea of Negong, or as it is presented in the setting, this idea of San, this power that exists within individuals, has the ability to manifest and has the ability to interact with technology because, well, it's sci-fi and that's a thing that needs to happen. So it's not as simple as just redefining what the galactic underworld will be. It really was going through and asking some questions about the cultures from which this arose how it developed, how it spread out throughout the galaxy, and trying to make it something of my own, and not just an imported copy and paste job from another setting, from another world, from another genre. And hopefully I've been able to do that. I think I've done a fairly good job. I'm kind of happy with the uh, whip as it is right now, the work in progress. It, it, it's definitely in progress, and I keep going back and editing previously posted articles as I discover more through the world building process. But I am really excited to see how this new understanding and this notion of the of the Ganshar of the galactic underworld will really affect everything that I'm doing in the story going forward. Especially since some of the characters will be a part of it, others will not, at least not initially in the story. And learning to how it will affect them and how it will change their understanding of their place in the galaxy and their place in the world, it's, it's fascinating and it's fun. Now, I will put a link to the article that I wrote on the Udigal in the show notes if you want to read it. I am this concept is something that I just find fascinating and honestly in some ways it's inspired more by old stories that I read in like heavy metal magazine and in places like that it has hints of the work of Robert E. Howard sprinkled throughout it. it. It hopefully will come off as something that is more in my voice than a cobbled together series of elements from other places that I rather enjoyed. But 
it's a constant effort to take those inspirations and to translate them into my own world. And I hope you like it. <laughs> and I hope you like this episode because I do want to be talking more about my fiction and my work on this podcast. And I want to do it in a way that will be friendly for both readers of mine and for those of you who listen because you're writers. Because I think there's a good balance there. And I'm not sure exactly how I want to do that yet. So if you have any ideas in the show notes, you'll find a link to the voice message system. I would love to hear from you. Keep it short, keep it clean so I can use it on the show. I, I would definitely like to hear how you would like me to talk more about my writing so that I make this show good for you and not just like an ego stroking, you know, endeavor on my part. If you'd rather hit me up on social media, I am CE Dorset on both Instagram and Twitter. You can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. If you haven't already, please do take a moment to rate this podcast in whatever app you're listening to me on. It really does help out a lot. If you have a dollar you can pass my way, that would be greatly appreciated. It's how I make my money between the ads on this show and the people who graciously helps who support me. You'll find a link in the show notes to both my Patreon and the community support, the listener support page. Um, the difference between the two is the people on Patreon occasionally get stuff from me. If you don't have any money right now, that's okay. I really understand that there are a lot of people that I wouldn't be giving money to, and I just don't have the funds right now. But if you know somebody you think would like any of the stuff that I'm doing, from my books to the world building to the podcast, do share it with them. That helps out a lot. It helps out more than you know. And I want to say thank you to everybody who is supporting me through either the listener support system or Patreon. It really does mean the world to me. So until next time, don't forget, have the fun. Bye. <laughs>